So interviews form one part of our assessment, the others being grades, uh, school statement and personal statement, all of that set within the context of educational background. Um, in the interview, we want to see how things work in a two-way interaction. So we'll typically ask a question, and then because it's an interactive event, um, the discussion evolves. And so every interview tends to start in the same way, but then goes in its own direction. Uh, what we do at Trinity, we have a maths test. So the students um, answer about 10 questions uh, before the interview. Um, and typically a good student will answer five of those questions. Uh, they'll cover things that many students haven't covered in school yet, so we're not, answer we're not expecting all students to have answered every question. Um, and then afterwards we have a half-hour interview that uh, talks about the questions um, and how the students found the answers. Um, after the maths interview we have a general interview, which is what I'm about to do now. In that uh, we tend to ask a problem-solving question um, and again, see how the student reacts to a question they haven't come across before. I mean, in all of these, um, we're not really interested in the exact answer. We're interested in seeing how the student works their way to the answer. Um, now, the person doing this is Ellie. I haven't met Ellie before. She is a first-year natural scientist, so somewhat related to engineering, um, but hasn't done the engineering course. So this will be a new sort of question to her. Um, and uh, it doesn't require you to know very much, the question I will ask her. It's one I asked about six years ago, so we've seen the students who did that question go all the way through Cambridge, um, and those who did well on this question tended to do well uh, in all the exams at Cambridge, they did well here. So it's been quite a good question in that sense. Um, I think all of them, the first time I answered the question, gave me the look that said, how on earth do I answer that? But in the course of the interview, or a two-way interaction, uh, they worked out how to answer it. So with that introduction, let's meet Ellie. Come in. Ellie, hi. Hi. Good to meet you. Matthew Juniper, have a seat. Hello, thank you very much. Right. Welcome to Cambridge. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks very much for your personal statement. I've had a look through it. Um, I have many questions, so there'll only be time for a couple. Uh, okay. But if we start with your... Um, you said at higher level uh, you did an extended project work, yes. um, looking particularly at methods to measure the electron's mass and charge. Yes. I was intrigued, did you um, actually measure the mass and charge yourself? Uh, I did Merkin's oil drop experiment, yeah. um, so that was to measure the charge. And then to measure the mass, I think I used the electron diffraction tube and looking at the deflection. Um, yeah. Which but you actually did that? Yeah, I did. Awesome. Yes. Really? So, how, and how did you do the chart? I've never done them myself, so I'm very intrigued. The, the droplet, I know you put the electrons yeah, in there. Yeah, so also. it's like a... Um, so it's a kind of like tube thing, and you have an oil spray, and then you use a kind of radiation source to ionise the droplets, and then you kind of look at... I think it's the terminal velocity as they move up and down when you apply an electric field across it. Mm. And then from that you can determine um, like kind of the charge and then you know it has to be a multiple of the electron charge and then you kind of work backwards but yeah. you have to do it lots of times because they're obviously really large errors. Yeah. And so it's a significant error analysis as well. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you do that? Um, I think we used, well I used um, kind of uh, like kind of because on the on the scale on the thing you obviously use half a half a scale and then just add up all of the errors that you can find but obviously the actual error was way bigger than mm. what you could calculate because I mean hu there's obviously human error in the way you, where you can actually read the scale from and stuff like that yeah um, and then also when I plotted a graph I used um, the Excel to calculate the error in the gradient yeah um, and so what types of errors were there uh, so obviously reading errors, um, human error, and actually working out where the electro uh, the, the oil drop was. Um, I think errors on the timers, errors mm. on, yeah, no quite. And sort of what type of error were they? Oh, so um, kind of experimental errors. I think there was also systematic errors, but I wasn't to do with the equipment, but I can't exactly remember what they were. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, that's interesting. It'd be good to hear more. Uh, uh, and you were you mentioned also the electron's mass. Yes. How did you do that? So I used a 
the you know the diffraction tubes where you have um, accelerated beam of electrons, so like a kind of cathode ray tube, and then mm. um, you apply an electric field between two plates, and you get oh no 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 yeah so you accelerate the electrons and then you pass them through a diffraction grating, uh, and then they diffract and you end up with the kind of rings on the screen mm. at the end. Um, and then I think by measuring the deflection um, of the, the f I think it was the first string, um, you can use the Bragg equation and work out work out the mass from that using the angle of deflection and stuff like that. And was that within an electric charge between two plates? Yes, was to it? accelerate them. I think. I could have done the crossed electric and magnetic fields using the coils that you put mm. on the, the side, but I don't think we had the apparatus, so mm. I couldn't do that. Um, cool. And were you, um, when you did this, were you sort of copying experiments that had been done a hundred years ago, deliberately, or were you making your own uh, from scratch? Um, I was largely following kind of instructions before, but I think I edited the mass one slightly because I think it was designed to measure the uh, Planck's constant, mm. but I kind of swapped it around. Yeah. And how long did it take? Um, Millikan's oil drop experiment took forever because I had to repeat it so many times. Yeah. Um, but the other one didn't take too long. I think it, I did it in a couple of hours. Oh, really? Um, but I mean, overall, the project was, I think we started um, at the start of term, and, mm. or like started the school term. And I finished it in April time. Right. Yeah. So a significant so project. It was quite big. Yeah. yeah. I think it was. Yeah. It's quite a big proportion of the exam. So yeah. Good. Um, and then you also say you explored the exciting chemistry behind paint colours. Now uh, I paint. I'm not very good. Um, but I've never thought about the exciting chemistry behind paint colours. What were you doing there? Oh, so basically, we were um, just making pigments. Um, so it's really cool because you just. So quite a lot of them were kind of precipitation experiments or precipitation precipitation reactions. So taking two different kind of chemicals and you add them together and you get this, a different salt, which is insoluble, and so you end up with a colourful one. So I think quite often you use lead salts, mm. um, especially in yellow and white. I think, and then we also did some other other more complicated ones where you kind of heat. We also did one creating a glass, so I think to create a kind of light blue colour you um, you create a glass which they, you then grind down and make into, into paint, so that was really fun. Really? So, so they're quite different then, different types of yeah, chemistry? Yeah, so there, are, there, are loads of diff there are loads of different ones, so there are really simple ones where you literally just get two chemicals, put them together and it creates mm. a, a pigment, but then yeah, there are, there are much more complicated ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. Right, um, so I guess in a normal interview I'd, I would actually spend a bit longer on the personal statement, yeah. but I want to sort of jump to the, um, the problem-solving part. Okay. And um, what I want to do is ask a, a question that will sound simple. Okay. And what I want to do is get to an answer, and I'm mainly interested in how you get there, not that the answer is completely correct. Okay, yeah. Um, you can ask me, an, ask me anything you like and okay. write anything down you like. It's okay. generally a good idea to tell me how you're thinking. Okay. So, uh, say I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Uh, tell me what you're doing. Okay. But I'm really interested in hearing what you think, not what I think you think. So I might be quite quiet. And there might be periods of silence. And that's totally okay. normal. Okay. So, um, are you ready? Yeah. Have you seen one of these before? No. So this was a Christmas present to my four-year-old son. It's okay. the most irritating toy in the <laughs> world. You ready? Yep. Oh, there it goes, on its itinerary of destruction. Thank you. So, that's the toy. Basically, it hovers in front of you, yeah. and then it races around the room, destroying yeah. stuff. Yeah. So the question is, how much power does it use? Okay. And you can do whatever you like with it. Okay, so just... So it'd be something to do with the speed at which these are rotating. Um, and I guess, is it battery powered? Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay. Um, 
so it's firstly got to accelerate the, the what do you call them, propellers. Um, but then I guess once they're moving at a fixed velocity, it'll just need to maintain that. Um, so, would you need to factor in kind of like air resistance and having, I don't really know, do you want me to write stuff down as well? Well, what I want to get to, in, and it might take 15, 20 minutes, okay. is a number, you know, X, Y. Okay, so kind of estimating yeah. things as well. Okay. And I'm really interested in how you get there okay. and what you're thinking as you do it. Okay. And that's all. So that's why I say, you know, let me know what you're thinking. Okay, so the blades will be moving at 20 revolutions a second or a bit less than that, probably. Well, that's interesting. How could you work that out? Um, you need to measure, well, you need to measure how fast they're going. Um, so, I don't, I'm not sure, so, so it'll be how fast this is turning would be the, would be the number of revolutions. I guess you could measure it manually, but that would be quite hard. I think it goes too fast to, to kind of look at it and do it. So I guess, is there something in there that you can, you can find out how fast it's going? Or well, we're not going to take it apart. Um, OK. So, but this is interesting. So this is spinning in front of you. Yeah. You're right. You can't really see uh, yeah. okay. them rotating. But if you wanted to know how fast they were going as they were spinning, mm -hmm. um, how could you do that? And what equipment would you need to do that? Um, I guess you could use a light gate. What's that? So you have the... It has like a, a laser beam and it can measure how... Like the, the time between when the, the beam is broken. So I guess if you... If you had it set up, and you you put the put the beam between those, mm -hmm. then you could measure the time taken to for like kind of half a revolution because it would get broken by the, the like the other half of the one before yeah, it got yeah. broken by the the other one. So you could measure the speed of the end of the blade, um, and then if you know the like the length, you can then work out the angular velocity. And then you can work out the number of revolutions mm -hmm. per minute. Um, I'm just trying to remember how you work out power. So power is oh my god um, velocity times the force, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you need to work out what mm. how do you so then you need to work out the force that you require to maintain the, the the like rotation of the blade so i guess you need to estimate um kind of friction in here and the energy you need or the power you need the force you need to accelerate them to the the right velocity and then, because I guess you, accel you accelerate them and then it reaches a point where they're not going any faster, mm. which will be limited by this, the, the, the kind of mechanism inside, mm -hmm. uh, rather than by a kind of terminal velocity kind of thing, won't you? Yeah. I think you're, you're, you, everything you said is right, um, but it's, it's going to get stuck on this one thing which is you, yeah. you might be able to work out the speed at which they're turning, yeah. but working out the torque, the force, the moment, yeah. that's really hard. Yeah. And in fact, I think you could do it with a little torque meter on there, but I think it would be... Okay. Um, th th there's another way of doing it. Okay. I mean, you can turn it on if you like. Okay. Watch out. Okay. You turn How it, do you...? You flick a little switch at the bottom. Oh, okay, that tiny thing. You wait for it to go red. And then just hold it, don't let go of it. So 
So can you do something measuring the, the force upwards? Yeah, that's so I'm just going to take it off you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you can feel it pulling upwards. Mm -hmm. So is there a way that you could measure the, the force of it pushing upwards? Would that be related to the power? What's the force pulling it upwards? The lift from there. Yeah. But you can work it out. You can work it out. Yeah. Okay. Using using something to measure it or by calculating the lift from each of these blades. So when it's hovering in front of you. Yeah. What what are the forces on the Oh the thing? so you can measure the force upwards by working out what force you need to keep it still. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm not sure how you do that. By using, I guess, I guess if you put weights on it and added them incrementally, then you could find out when it no longer manages to lift up. Yeah, okay. So let's, I think we need to sort of simplify the problem and say instead of, you're quite rightly focusing on how it accelerates away, yeah. let's imagine it's just hovering like okay. that. Yeah. You know, just as it is now. Okay. Um, and, and take it from there. So it's hovering in front of you. Okay. So the upward force would be equal to its weight. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. So then you have the force, or kind of the lift. So then can you use that with the velocity? Or is that not the same? That's not the same as the torque, is it? It's not the same, no. So, would you, cal would you need to calculate the torque at the ends of the blades? Um, what is that? So torque is force times radius, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so you'd be able to work out the torque at because I guess that's the upward force, isn't it? So that's different from the, the, the force that you have. Yes, yeah, so you need to work out how to convert the upward force into the kind of rotational torque. Um, Maybe if we just take a step back okay. and imagine holding it like this. Yeah. So, it, it, well, the, imagine it was hovering in front of you. Okay, yeah. So there's obviously gravity pulling down, yeah. and that gives it its weight. Um, what's keeping it up in the air? The kind of lift from the... The lift from the blades, yeah. yeah. But, you know, when you hold this, what do you feel? The air moving, and it kind of pulling up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's just think about that a bit more. Okay. So when they're turning round, they're displacing the air? Yeah. Okay. So... You can measure the flow of air or something? Does that help at all? Yeah. I mean, I guess when you look at a helicopter hovering in the sky... Yeah. Why does it hover in the sky? What's it doing to the air? Um, oh, pushing it downwards. Yeah, pushing it down. And why does pushing air down... Because you get the, the reaction force that pushes the blade up. Yeah. Okay. So if you know... So if you know the force that's pushing down, then you know the force is pushing up. And then you can use that to calculate the power mm. of the thing. So you can calculate the power from the force required to hover this weight. Mm. Okay. So I'm not entirely sure what equation you'd use there. So Let's think about the helicopter, because okay. you've seen a helicopter before. It yes. hovers in the air. Yeah. 
and it does so by blowing the air down. Yeah. Okay. So what's the helicopter doing to the air? Kind of displacing it. Yeah. Um. Oh, I don't know. Kind of. I guess. So the blades. So the blades move through the air like that. So mm. it kind of compresses the air underneath. Well, let's let's think from the air's point of view. You're a bit of air hovering in the sky. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then a helicopter comes along. Okay. What happens to you? As a piece of air. You move. Yeah. Down. You move down. So you're what's let's say you were still beforehand. Okay. And then suddenly you find yourself moving down. Mm -hmm. So what's happened to your momentum? It's increased. Yeah. Okay. Also, you've got to think about conservation of momentum. Yeah. Okay. Also, the momentum of the air will be related to the power of the helicopter. Or not. Well, let's to start. The power is the sort of the end bit. Okay. At the moment, we're thinking, how much force do we okay. need? Oh, yeah, because momentum is the force. So, so momentum is the product of the force and the time period mm -hmm. over which the change in momentum happens. Yeah, there's actually a much nicer way of saying that. Oh. Um, you integrate force with respect to time. Yeah, and even without the integral? Force times time. Yeah, well... Or... So you've got, uh, you know F equals ma? Yeah. Um, and you're used, to, you can write a oh, as... D A D P by dt. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we've got that force equals... in Mass. words. Mass times the differential of momentum. Of velocity. Oh, of yeah. velocity, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, what you just said, dp by dt, p being momentum, you've got that. the force is equal to the rate of change in momentum. Yeah, okay. That's, that's really where we need to get to. Okay. So, so we know that the force we need is that weight, which yeah. we can estimate. Okay. So, so then we know the rate of change in momentum. Yeah. So then we have another yeah. question, which is to work out the rate of change in momentum. Okay, so you do that by changing, calculating the rate of change of momentum of the air. Mm. Um, so you need to calculate the speed of the air after it's been moved by the blades. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how you could measure the speed of the air. Well, do you need to measure it? Or you just need to know that Can you measure the... How else could you measure momentum? Oh, using the force. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so... So if you know the force on the air, which is kind of the same as the force on the, like upwards on the, the thing, and then you know the time period over which mm. it's, or do you? Well, we know this is hovering, so yeah. we, know, we know the force on the air. Uh -huh. So there's constant force. Yeah. So there's a constant change, no. So force is the rate of change of momentum. So if the force is constant, then the rate of change of momentum is zero. No. No? It's dependent on time. No, you just said it. You said that the force is the rate of change of momentum, and the force is constant. So the rate of change of momentum is constant? Yeah. Okay. 
So now you've got to... Oh, so if you know... And then you just integrate that with respect to type to get the momentum. Well, I think that if you were looking for the, the change in momentum of a blob of air as it went through, you're right. Yeah. But actually we're interested in the steady state here. Okay. So this thing is hovering in space. Okay. And some of the air mm -hmm. is getting pushed down. Okay. And when some of the air gets pushed down, obviously it's still to start with. Yeah. And then it suddenly gets pushed down. Yeah. And its change in momentum is enough to supply the force to keep this in the air. Okay. So now we need to work out how much air is being pushed down, how, how fast. Oh, okay. So how much air is being pushed down would be in relation to the, the area of the blades. Yeah. Um, so I guess this amount of air will be pushed down. Can I stop you for a second and just do this? Because it helps sometimes to see it. Oh, all the the kind of that much air will be pushed down yeah. every time it rotates, or twice every time it rotates, because you have two blades on either side, or four times. It might help at this stage to draw a little simple diagram okay. on the paper of what of what it's of what's going on. Okay, so you have. I just draw it in the box. So you have the first blade, mm -hmm. and here the second blade, and you have the weight. Yeah, good. And you have the force. That's right, so we've got the, the two blades yeah. side on, and mm -hmm. the, the mass yeah. giving you the force down. Okay, and then you have, this is the air being, well that's kind of air being displaced. What about this side? And on that side. Yeah. And every time it rot every time it rotates, you have the kind of that the circle mm -hmm. of air being pushed down twice. So the so the kind of area would be pi r squared with the radius of that. But then for volume, would you count how, how much, how far down would you? Well, or does that I think you've got so the main much? point there. That's the area, okay. which we can call pi r squared or mm -hmm. a, whatever okay, you want to yeah. call it. So let's just work with that. And okay. let's say that the air is uniformly pushed down at some speed v. Okay. And this is... Okay. And so... So we'd said that if you know the force, then you know the rate of change of momentum. Mm -hmm. And that's related to the rate at which the air is pushed down. Is that, is that what we're saying? Yeah. And then, so if you, know, if you know that this much air is pushed down per revolution, then you can calculate the speed that it's moving round. So I think we need to almost think of this in a, take a step back. Okay, in, larger in a, context. And if we look at this, okay. we've got the, that area mm -hmm. of air. The air starts off zero and then yeah. it's pushed down. Okay. And so rather than focusing on the individual blades and whether there are two or just one, Okay. I think we can think about... We need to think about above and exactly. below. Yeah. So above it, it's zero. The speed is zero. And below yeah. it, it's V. Yeah. And so that gives you the change in momentum. It gives you the change in speed. Change in speed. And then you can calculate the change in momentum from Yeah. That. Well, let's do it. Okay. So if you start by writing down what you know... Um, so we know, I guess, density of air. Yeah. Um, which, can we just call it D or something? Can we call it rho? Okay, is that, that's rho. That's rho. Okay. Um, so, and we want... Um, is that the change in momentum? Yeah. Is the change in... Velocity, velocity times the mass. Times mass. And so you need the mass, but you need the volume of air. So can you just say 
the volume there is just A times. Do you want to do it using What we could do, what we could do is say, let's imagine one second. Okay. Let's imagine running this for one second. Okay. So in one second you'd have, so this would be V times one, because you'd have that volume of air moving through. Yeah, when you say this, what do you mean by this? I'm just aware that the cameras can't see this, so... Oh, so the, um, the, like, kind of width of the air, or the, the depth of air moving through the yeah. blades per second would just be equal to the velocity. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So you have a sort of column of air moving through yeah. every second that yeah. is that height. Okay, so then the mass would be A, V times the density. So that, and then times the change, and then to get the change in momentum, you times it by the change in velocity, which yeah. is v. Yeah. So it's a. Is that? That looks about right. Okay. And then we wanted to, and so we said the force was equal to the rate of change. Of momentum, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Which is equal to the mass overall or the weight. Yep. Um, Are we, we're, are we trying to find this? Shall I just, we'll just yeah. remind you what you got here. You got yeah. delta rho, remember this is in one second. Okay. Which is that. Okay, And yeah. here you've got, sorry, dp, not d rho, uh, delta momentum in yeah. one second, and this is dp by dt. Okay. So... This is per, per one second. Yeah. So... To have it dp, so is that dp by dt, or is delta p by? So in two, so to change it to delta p overall, you add the delta t on here. Would you? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So so dp is a. So that delta t. Yeah. And then, so to get dp by dt, you just. Yep. Okay. And is that okay? Because it's deltas rather than. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And what's that equal to? The mass times. Yeah. All right, so now we've got a really nice equation here. mg yeah. is a rho v squared. Okay. So we're relating the weight to the, the force to the change in momentum. Yeah. Now at this stage it's worth checking the dimensions. Okay, so area is going to be in meter squared. This is going to be in kilograms per meter cubed. Yep. This will be in meters per second kilograms and of what G is newtons per kilogram which is is that is that right? Honestly G I find easiest to think of as an acceleration. Oh yeah. Um yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. And Remember okay. that squared? Yeah, so. So that, yeah, so you end up with overall kilograms meter second. Yeah. Okay, so they do, they do match. Well, that's a relief. Yes. Good, okay. Okay.
Right, so you've related there the force to the change in momentum, or the rate of change in momentum. Yeah. And you need to get the power. Shall I turn it on again? Uh, Just because it's fun. Yes. Okay, so we now have got a relationship between the force and the velocity. Actually, if, if we know A, if we know everything else, we can work out the velocity from that. Okay. And can you work out the power from here? Yeah. How? So, we said power is force times velocity. Mm -hmm. So, so that would used to be mb mgv. That's right. And so it's equal to a rho v. But we need to know what the velocity is. But it's not a rho v. Oh, it's cute. Yeah. Okay. So that's the power. So the thing that you need to find is the velocity. Mm -hmm. Which you can find using this. Yeah. Okay. So now... And then, okay, so if you say... So, V... I'm just going to have to do this. It's fine. Okay, so... Is that looking? All right, well, let's work it out. Okay, so if I do, just move over here. So that would be, and then a, is that? Uh, I think that's right. Right. Um, is it the same thing you've written down? You cancelled out one of the a e rows. Yes, I think so. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to need to estimate some things. Okay. So, estimate the mass as... Oh, it's pretty light. Like 50 grams? Is that... Sounds about right. Roughly right. So... That's 50 grams. Uh, so G is, can we say it's 10? Yeah. Okay. Um, area, oh god, I want to say 10 centimetres, but that distance there it might be, it's probably longer than that. It's a little bit more. 15? Or? I think you're right to say it's a bit more than 10. Let's, I think more like 12. Okay, so we'll go 12. Yeah. Uh, and density of air is small. I'm not entirely sure what the density of air is. Um, so water is one gram per cubic centimetre, so it's going to be a lot less than that. So, zero point, well if water is one gram per cubic centimetre, then that's So air is going to be like a thousand times less than that? Almost exactly right, yeah. It's 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay. Okay, everything in SI units. Look at the area again. Oh, that's just the radius right now, isn't yeah. it? So, so the area is going to be pi times. 0.12. Very good. Uh, now, did you bring a calculator? No, sorry. Because I left mine at work. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, sorry, I forgot. Right, we'll use the phone. Okay, so, what do we have? 0 0.05. Who's doing it? Start at the top. Oh, um, yeah, okay. Uh, times 10. So 0 0.05. 0 .05. Uh, times 10 and then to the power of 
3 over 2, so 0 0.5. Uh, to the power of 3 upon 2. Yeah. Right, 0.3535. Probably best to write that down so I didn't mess it up. Okay. 3535. I'll just clear that. The next one. Over area, which is pi times 0 0.12 squared. And then times 1.2. And then everything to the power of half. All of that square rooted? Yeah. That's 0.232. Okay, and then just 0.3535 over 0.232. Okay, so we get about 1.5. Yeah. What are the units? Uh, what? Yeah. Now, I think we've made a slight mistake there, but the mistake is only in the numbers. Okay. Um, I think the equation is correct, so that's fine. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. How was that? Um, quite stressful. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. The nature of an interview to be a little bit stressful. Yeah, and I, I think if you're not stressed and nervous, then, um, mm -hmm. you, then it's not right. I yeah. think everyone is stressed and nervous. Yeah. Um, good. Well, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Um, so, how did it go? Uh, the response to personal questions was good. The personal statement, sorry, was good. Um, uh, the, the trick with the personal statement is if you've written something down, remember it'll come up at interview. So, uh, to be truthful, and she was definitely truthful. She'd done all of the things she said, and it was really quite impressive what she'd done. Um, thinking now about the problem-solving question, uh, she actually started off going in completely the wrong direction, and that's very normal. The student doesn't know what the right direction is. It's the first time they've seen the problem. So it's quite normal for someone to go off in the wrong direction. What you want is something that Ellie did, which is really good. She was very receptive to being nudged back in the right direction. Um, and in fact, I think it was uh, all she had to do was hold this little thing in her hands um, and feel the air coming down onto her hand to realise the way that she be, should be going in that um, question to answer it. I'd say she really started to shine when she started writing things down. And at that stage, she drew a little diagram. Uh, and the advantage of drawing a diagram is that you automatically simplify, and also you start explaining things visually that until then you've only been explaining verbally. And so it's much easier for me to see what she's doing. <coughs> and it's also, I think, easier for her to see what the really important points are in this problem. So what she was doing was taking a situation and then making a simplified model of that situation on the paper. Um, and I think once she started thinking about what would happen in one second, I knew at that stage we were home and dry, that she would get to the final answer. It took a little bit longer to get there. Uh, we had a bit of algebra, and she was good at the algebra. That was good. Um, she, uh, we checked the dimensions, of course, halfway through, and really that's a confirmation that we're on the right track. Um, and I think we made a slight mistake with the numbers at the end, but I'm really not worried about that sort of mistake. I can see the right equation in front of me, um, and that's really all I want. Uh, so what was good? Um, Ellie was very sort of flexible and receptive to nudges. So she would, um, when going off in the wrong direction, she was very receptive to being nudged back in the right direction. She realised she was going in the wrong direction as well. Um, she was good with the, uh, with the modelling and with the algebra, so that's good as well. Um, areas of concern, really not that many. Um, I'd expect someone to know the density of air, roughly a kilogram per metre cubed. Uh, as it happened, she guessed it absolutely bang on, so that's the second best thing to do. Um, other than that, I think she did very well, and that's it.